quality. That's obviously going to hurt Chilton's chances. I have him all the way down at 25. Marco Andretti, I still think he is a contender for, you know, the top nine, as is Tony Kanaan. I have Marco at 14, at 11, and then Tony Kanaan at 15, and that's all the drivers that are participating in uh, the IndyCar Grand Prix on my list. And then you look at the Indy-only runners, uh, a few notables I have that are further up on the list. Uh, for instance, I have uh, Fernando Alonso currently at position number 20. Uh, Oriol Servia at 21. Uh, again, that deal has not been finalized yet. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people on the cut line that would like to see one less car there. That means one available spot available if Servia does not perform. Charlie Kimball uh, has done well at Indy in the past, but again, the Carlin regression has me a little bit concerned. I have him at 22. Uh, James Davison, I think, is solidly it for coin. I have him at 24. Um, again, the other Indy only, Connor Daly, is a little bit iffy about Daly, but the performance he had on the open test, it gives me a little more confidence. I have him currently at number 27. Dryer and Reinbold, I think that's the team that right now of the multi-car teams that have multiple entries, I think that's the team that really could be on, behind the eight ball. I only have Sage Karam at number 28, and I have J.R. Hildebrand at number 31 right now. And then my last car in, Jordan King, uh, I think the fact that he is in a Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan car will save him from being bumped, but uh, it's going to be a tight fit for Jordan considering he has no oval experience. And then the three I have out, and that's, I think, you could, I don't think you can argue with me on any of these three, Tom. Kyle Kaiser, uh, U-Coast Racing, I think their focus right now is more on IMSA competition and sports cars than it is IndyCar. Uh, ben Hanley, Dragon Speed, two decent performances on road courses, but again, they've never run out of an oval, so it's safe for Hanley, who did not participate at the open test. And then Klaus and Marshall, they've never even had a test, uh, a run with the car at all. And then you're expecting them to go out and in just four days, assuming no rain and those any of those four days of practice, and get a car ready to be able to qualify for Indy. As much as I love Pip, I just don't see that happening. So if you say right now, who are the three most likely drivers who are going to fail to qualify next weekend? Kaiser, Hanley, and Mann, I think, are the three that are in the most danger of failing to qualify for the 130 Indy 500 next weekend, Tom. Well, we'll be down there. You and I will be down there uh, as we are every year. Uh, and uh, we will we will have it all uh, covered, obviously, on social media. We'll have our show, and then I know Tyson talked with him yesterday. He wanted to join us today, but he will join us uh, for the Field of 33, which will not be this weekend, but will be the following weekend, which is our special yearly uh, the day before the 500 uh, special that we do called the Field of 33. We take all two hours up. And we talk about it. So the entire racing team here with the balance. We join us, Tyson Lautenschlager uh, from OnHitRoad.com, yourself, Steve Wilson from Speedway Digest. And we've got some other guests that always show up as well for the field of 33. So getting really excited about it. But let's get back on track. Uh, no pun intended. But let's get back on track for the Grand Prix, as obviously that's the highlight of it is, as it is. Obviously a 2.439-mile uh, uh, road course. So, uh, Matthew, uh, I know we may have some uh, late joiners, people that might be joining us, and we're talking IndyCar Grand Prix today, uh, and uh, Steve Wilson from Speedway Digest is going to be joining us here in just a few minutes uh, to, to uh, talk to th- about this, and we'll talk some NASCAR as well. Uh, but let's, uh, again, let's do a recap and uh, take us turn by turn at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway road course. Actually, there's something else I want to play here. This was from David Land show, and this was something he interesting. He said a couple of days ago about the IndyCar Grand Prix. Listen to this. That's all. In around 2012, 2013, I would say the Indy 500 hit its low point. It probably hit rock bottom. Attendance, interest, both nationally, internationally, and even locally, which is very important for ticket sales, it was at its rock bottom. Now, of course, that was around the time that the IndyCar Grand Prix came into play. Now, what David Land is saying on his Twitter page and on YouTube is that they need to get rid of the IndyCar Grand Prix because it has lost its luster and its necessity as part of the butt the bay. What do you think, Tom? Do you think uh, that he has a point here? Because I don't see where he's coming from this. Normally, really I agree with him on those kind of things, but with getting rid of the IndyCar Grand Prix, uh, I don't know about that. 
Yeah, I follow him, and, and I like his stuff. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I do. Uh, he sometimes jumps on the hot take, hot take bandwagon, and that's okay. I mean, that, that gets clicks, and that gets listens, and I get it. I, I do, too, as well. As you know, I get on the hot takes bandwagon sometimes. So I think that's all that is. I think it's a hot take. I think that the reason why they brought the Grand Prix was to bring back the true month of May because if you think about it, before the Grand Prix, we had really one week. We had basically a week and a half, and yes, that's more than any other track gets, but this is May. This is Indianapolis. There's so much tradition built in here, and I think that so many people were desiring that and missing that and missing what it really does mean to the city of Indianapolis, to the fans of IndyCar, to have a month of May. And this Grand Prix just really allows that to happen. And, and, and let's look at it from the other aspect of it. We had a road course that they spent millions of dollars designing, have all of this technology that a lot of courses don't have, and that's to, to give it from a road course uh, to a um, a road course uh, to, to an oval. And I know NASCAR uses it some too, but I don't know that they, they would have gotten as use, much use out of it. It would be empty space. It would be empty land. So from a venue standpoint, uh, and, and let's just face it, that's what it is. This is a venue, uh, and IndyCar decides to run their cars at this venue. So from a venue standpoint, you want to use things that are profitable to you. So the road course and the Grand Prix, especially as we heard yesterday in the leadership press conference, ticket sales are going back up. So it's kind of a you you have your ups and flows, you have your ups and downs, uh, but it, it looks like it's on the uptick. So I no I, in in this particular case I disagree with him on that. I think it's a hot take bus, but that's fine. Uh, we all get on that every every now and then. But so let's go ahead I and agree let's with go you through. on that scenario because I mean you're just wasting space if you're going to get rid of the IndyCar Grand Prix because other than that uh, the vintage race would be the only race using that road course. For the which would include the Trans Am race there, but uh, beyond that, you're kind of just wasting time uh, with all the money uh, for creating that uh, circuit and the alterations, for instance, to Brickyard Crossing and all of that. So I don't know what you'd be gaining uh, by getting rid of the event. Well, yeah, and <laughs> I mean, let's let's let's. let's I, I'm an IU guy. I use not coming back. Bobby Knight's not coming back. Formula One is not coming back to IndyCar. So let's move on. Matt, we've got to get we got to get back on point here. So let's go. Uh, by, and, and by all means, I know you know the track better than anybody. Uh, by all means, if you're uh, tell us if you're a fan, where, where's the best place to watch this? Obviously, you want to look at it a little bit different than what you would the over course. Take us turn by turn. If you were uh, driving the pace car, what would you be seeing ahead of you? Well, obviously, the place to be would be the end of the – in the turn into the infield, which would be turn one because we've seen drama there on the opening lap, and that's a very tight chicane. The end of Holman Boulevard is a place to look, and then also the snake pit area, the entrance into there, even though you know the buildings and the grandstands kind of uh, block the view there. If you're looking for the places to pass where the action is, those are probably the three places to go with maybe a favoritism toward uh, the main straightaway and the entrance in the infield and the end of Holman Boulevard being the top two spots uh, if you're looking for the action. Beyond that, uh, probably don't want to be in the main grandstands unless you're interested in the pit stops because really nothing happens on the main straightaways that you could see. And uh, going on beyond that, uh, I'd say if you're looking for the spots, the mounds in turn one and uh, the end of Holman Boulevard would be the places to watch uh, if you're coming down there today. Let's talk a little bit about our rookie class, and uh, certainly we, we, we've talked about uh, Felix Rosenfex. we got Colton Herter we've talked about. Uh, we've also talked about uh, Marcus Harrison, uh, Santonio Sento- Ferrucci, <laughs> and uh, Tino Ferrucci. And Award is our other rookie on today's uh, IndyCar Grand Prix. Talk with us about the 2019 rookie class. I think, obviously, we've seen the pace for Rosenquist and Herta. That's not a surprise. Erickson up there, I'd say, is a surprise considering that he struggled with this car, even though he's an ex-Formula 1 driver. Uh, Ferrucci, I think the question right now is between the ears. Uh, can he get a clue of not only how to handle himself, but to handle things? I mean, he drives like every lap is the last lap and gets himself in trouble, and that's not how you drive uh, to competitive. I mean, it works well at qualified sometimes, but it doesn't work well at race trim. 
and it just seems like he's overdriving the car. Uh, the award, the uh, fact that he eliminated round one, a qualified surprise me. I would have thought that if there was a guy, another rookie that would have been in the top six, the Firestone Fast Six, Pato Award would have been the guy that there. I mean, Red Bull's junior team doesn't sign an award just because they think he's okay. They see a lot of potential. This is a guy that they see potentially being an ex, a future Formula One driver in Pato Award. That's why the Red Bull junior team has him right now or signed him earlier this week. So the fact that he was only 19th and qualified yesterday, I'd say, was a big disappointment, or probably the biggest disappointment of all the qualifiers that were down at the bottom of the list. You know, let's talk a little bit about Scott Dixon. I I asked uh, Felix uh, yesterday in the press conference about what he's learned from being in the Chip Canassi camp. Obviously, Scott Dixon's one of the big ones, uh, but certainly there's a history with Chip Canassi in the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, our, our, fa- our, our favorite Scottishman uh, is over there as a consultant. Uh, we've got Scott Dixon. And I asked him, I was like, you know, what have you learned? What have you mentored? And he went on to talk about, he's like, I went – can't pinpoint to one certain thing, but what I can tell you is just being around them is what I've, what I've learned as well. So uh, Scott Dixon, uh, P2, obviously you've got uh, P1, the rookie out of Chip Canassi and P2, uh, Scott Dixon, what are your thoughts? Well, if not for the fish at Coda that was kind of ruined by the full course caution, Scott Dixon would be leading the championship right now. I mean, he's third in points right now, just a few behind, uh, the front runners at, uh, you know, looking into the month of May, and uh, things go the way I think they could go. He could easily be leading the championship uh, ahead of Newgarden and Rossi uh, after we get through the two races this month. But uh, I think the consistency is there. I mean, the guy is still going strong. I mean, we're talking this the guy now at age 38. He'll turn 39 on July the 22nd of this year. But uh, there's a reason he's known as the Iceman. He keeps himself under control. Uh, doesn't make the over-aggressive move unless the situation and the timing is right where it does not put himself at risk of getting taken himself out. And that's what you need is to be a competitor, not just the versatility, but the instinct to know when it's time to make the move and when it's time to hold your cards and keep them close to the vest. And that you will have that with the Scott Dixon. And that's why he wins championships, because he has the things in that controlling how to handle yourself better than most of the other drivers currently on the grid, if not that have run in the IndyCar Series since the exception in 1996. We're talking with Matthew Embry, WSVT of South Bend, our official IndyCar contributor. Joining us now is Steve Wilson, our partner in crime at the track uh, with Speedway Digest, editor-in-chief of Speedway Digest. Steve, uh, welcome aboard IndyCar uh, Grand Prix today. We're all about IndyCar, but we will, we will get into some NASCAR as well. Uh, We certainly appreciate your partnership with us, uh, the balance at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, But uh, as we look back on the qualification from yesterday, uh, or or any thoughts that you may have as we get into our second segment, uh, our second part of the show today, uh, but we're certainly focusing on the IndyCar Grand Prix. Go ahead, Steve. (laughs) Well, I missed it. I mean, I did keep up with it a little bit on Twitter. Um, I just think Chip Ganassi is strong. Um, I think they'll continue to be strong all through the month of May. Um, You know, Chip Ganassi has been struggling a little bit over on the NASCAR side, but, you know, they always seem to keep the same tempos over on the IndyCar side. And um, maybe at some point, uh, some of that luck will actually rub off on uh, either uh, Kyle Larson or Kurt Busch in their uh, NASCAR team. So uh, I just think that we'll continue to talk about them. Um, all through the month of May. I don't, I don't think anything is really going to change. Um, I mean, there are a lot of other strong teams out there, but, you know, we always seem to talk about Jim Cadassi Racing, and um, I wish we talked about it more on the NASCAR side, to be honest with you, but, you know, it is what it is, and, you know, hopefully, some, like I said, some of that luck will rub off. <laughs> no, Steve, you look at the right. scenarios Go with uh, Ganassi, and you look at the multiple institutions that he's involved with, you know, IndyCar, sports car, NASCAR, is the fact that he has so many conglomerates under his tag, is that is that part of the reason why this team is struggling so badly currently in stock car racing at this point? Um, well, I mean, Penske is pretty much the same thing. I mean, he runs supercars down in Australia. He's got IndyCar teams. He's, uh, he's got things all across the board. Um, so, I, 
I I think you know we're we're 